Good morning and welcome to the Diocese of Caledonia's worship on this, the second Sunday in Lent, on Sunday, February 28th. I am David Lehman, the Bishop of Caledonia, and I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Diocese of Caledonia serves on and with 10 First Nations, the Haida, Shimshan, Niska, Heisla, Gitsan, Wisetuan, Dilkane, Sikani, Dunija, Cree, and the Métis, a privilege which we are grateful to acknowledge. Our worship today comes from the service of the word to, and we have a guest preacher today, Archbishop Melissa Skelton, on this her last day as our Archbishop and as the Bishop, the Diocesan Bishop of the Diocese of New Westminster. So we are thankful that she is able to be with us today, and we pray with and for her as she transitions into retirement from Episcopal ministry uh, and um, begins uh, a new chapter in her life, and for the people of New Westminster as they welcome and enthrone their next diocesan bishop, John Stevens, today. I invite you to sing the hymns with enthusiasm, pray the prayers, and to enter into reflection with the readings. Our opening hymn is, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that you have again brought us together to praise you for your goodness and to ask your blessing. Give us grace to see your hand in the week that has passed and your purpose in the week to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, as we turn our hearts and minds to worship Almighty God, let us confess our sins with penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with our neighbors. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. 
we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful God, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord is our light and our life. O come, let us worship. We say together the Venite. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. The psalm appointed for today is a portion of Psalm 22, verses 22 to 30. We shall say them responsibly by the whole verse. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line give glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet on board the saving deeds that he has done. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In our first reading, Sarai is childless and advanced in years. She has not provided Abram with an heir. While his line can continue through Ishmael, he would much prefer that a son born of his wife be his heir. The first reading is written in the book of Genesis, beginning in the 17th chapter, at the first verse. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. 
kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We say together the canticle, You are God, also known as the Te Deum. You are God, we praise you. You are the Lord, we acclaim you. You are the Eternal Father, all creation worships you. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of the prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all worship, and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you did not shun the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come and be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. Clear in this epistle, Paul has argued that through the gospel it is faith that brings humankind into harmony with God, not adherence to Mosaic law. Now he takes Abraham as an example. The second reading is written in Paul's letter to the Romans beginning in the fourth chapter at the thirteenth verse. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Together we say the song of Zechariah, also known as the Benedictus. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born in the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, 
to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospels. Outside Israel, visiting the villages around Caesarea Philippi, Jesus has asked his disciples who they believe him to be. Peter has identified him as the Messiah, the one expected to come at the end of the era. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Greetings, people of the Diocese of Caledonia and the Diocese of Yukon. The process of moving one's things discloses much about a person. And here I'm speaking about myself, of course, in that next week I'll be moving from my home in Canada to my home in Washington State. Now, it's not just about learning about yourself as you sort through the stuff of your life and put those things in piles labeled keep, toss, or give away. Rather for this move, a move from a role I have loved, a people I have loved, and a country I have loved, what's fascinating to me is what I'm choosing to take with me in my car and not entrust to movers as I cross the border. I know that may sound kind of small and unimportant, but when I look at what I've set aside to take in my car, well, it says a lot about me. It says a lot about what's important to me as I go through what many call a transition process, an experience that to my mind is very much like a process of dying and being reborn, of letting go of many, many things, trusting that something new will emerge as I let go. And so here are some of those things that I'm taking with me in my car as I cross the border and move. A few beautiful pieces of pottery from my favorite BC potter, irreplaceable works of practical art from my way of thinking, gorgeous in themselves and also connected to meals, those times with people we love that are sacred. Assorted papers, yes, things like my birth certificate and tax documents, but also my son's drawings that I came across from when he was five or six, crayon sketches of masters of the universe figures, and along with them, in the middle of this, his sketch of God, an eagle feather given to me by Terry Alec, a residential school survivor who was one of the first to stand up and be counted in the courts related to the damage done to him and many others. Cards given to me or sent to me by my husband Eric over the years I've been in Canada. He makes them himself and they're always an intriguing combination of whimsy and sincerity. 
some wonderful gifts the diocese and province have given me. And of course, my dog Teddy, with all his papers in order to be accepted back into the U.S. These are the things I plan to take with me as I go through the process of letting go, of dying, and waiting for new life. The stuff that all real transitions are about. Peter, in John's Gospel for today, hears that his teacher, Jesus, is soon to begin the bumpiest process of transition imaginable, in which Jesus will have to give up his friends, his role among them, and his status as an up-and-coming rabbi messiah. And of course, this transition, Jesus' transition, is not about his moving house across a border. Instead, it's about his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. No compiling of important mementos or goodbye party here. Jesus' departure will be a time when everything in his life will be stripped away. And of course, Peter doesn't like this news at all, doesn't think that this is in any way proper or fitting. And so as Mark's Gospel tells us, Peter rebukes Jesus, and of course, Jesus comes right back at him. Get thee behind me, adversary, he says. You're not thinking straight. You have no idea how important to everyone and everything that my loss and leave-taking will be. And then after letting Peter really have it, Jesus turns to his disciples and to the broader crowd and says this, Listen, people, get this. If you want to follow me, if you want to pattern your life after me, You'll need to embrace a lifelong process of letting go of your life in order to discover new life for your own sake and for others as you respond to their needs. And then Jesus goes on, but this time with these questions. What good does it hold? What do, good does it do to hold on tightly to your life if what you're doing is squeezing the life out of it? What good does it do to hold on if holding on actually stops something new from being born. Oh my, Jesus is speaking to me here, but I would not only submit to you, I would proclaim to you that this morning he's also speaking to you. For haven't you and I been through in, in the middle of a protracted time of transition and loss for a year now? Haven't we been in a time of transition and loss in our personal lives, in the lives of our communities, and in the lives of our churches, in the lives of our country? Haven't we witnessed or heard about some people and communities going through experiences as harrowing as the description that Jesus shares with Peter about Jesus' own upcoming transition experience, the experience of vulnerability, of loss, of suffering, of death? And if we haven't ourselves experienced this level of suffering, haven't we ourselves experienced the disruption, the loss, the upended expectations, the kind of dislocation in place that the experience of transition can be about? And in all these things, in all these things, it seems to me a question keeps being posed to you and to me over and over again. What will we do with the experience of having to let go of a life or parts of a life that we have not only held dear, but we have grounded our life in? And what new life might emerge if we can just let go of some of it? But here's the thing as I think about this. What makes letting go so difficult, so scary, is that we're asked to let go without knowing, really, what lies on the other side of it. Yes, we witness in the life of Jesus that dying is the path to new life, that letting go is the experience that prepares us and others to take hold in a new way. But you and I don't get the assurance that a specific picture of what that new life looks like would give us. And so letting go can feel a lot like free fall. But is it really? Are we really alone in our losses and when we let go, or when we are given no option but to let go? Are we really alone in the process of the kind of dying that comes to us 
in many little ways or big ways throughout our lives or the kind of dying that will ultimately come to us just as it came to Jesus. Are we really in free fall with nothing or no one to catch us or to hold our hand as we fall? Our faith, of course, it would answer these questions with a resounding no. For in Jesus we have been, been given a Savior who has let go, who has lost everything, who has fallen as we have and as we are falling, and whose life testifies to the life-giving nature of this free fall. In Jesus, we have been extended a hand that comforts us and guides us now and in the end to the ground of our being, a ground that we in the world can stand on, safe and secure at last. This is what our faith would tell us. And my friends, this is what I've staked my life on as I've had to let go and fall over and over again in now almost 70 years. I want to end by returning for just a moment to my little story about what I'm taking with me in my car as I cross the border to move back to the U.S., that whole subject. As I mentioned in the story of Jesus' transition, he wasn't able to take anything along with him. In fact, the story is about stripping everything away. You might say that Jesus' story is a story of a transition in which everything had to be let go of in his departure. But as I think about it, I don't believe it's really true. For what he took along with him is the same thing that each of us and all of us take along with us when we're asked to let go of life in order to receive new life. He took along with him his most precious possession, the sum total of his life as he had enacted it, as he had loved within it, as he had learned from it, and as he had prayed through it. And this, my friends, is what you and I take with us as we cross over thresholds of loss and new life. We take the sum total of all we have been of all we have done, of everyone and everything we have loved, of all we have learned, and of every prayer we have offered. We take the sum total of all we have been, of all we have done, of everything and everyone we have loved, of all we have learned, and of every prayer we have offered. And this morning, people of the Diocese of Caledonia and the Diocese of Yukon and the ecclesiastical province of British Columbia in Yukon. For all these things, for all these most important things, I am forever grateful. Thank you, Your Grace, for your inspired word. Let us confess our baptismal faith as we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God of the Covenant, you call us to be fruitful servants within creation and to offer our lives as the foundation of your realm. We lay before you the desires of our hearts that we may be transformed by their fulfillment. With confidence and trust, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For the one holy Catholic and apostolic church throughout the world, especially remembering Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, Linda Nichols, our primate, Melissa Skelton, our metropolitan, and David Lehman, our bishop, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the Anglican Lutheran, cycle of prayer today, we're asked to pray for the Right Reverend John Organ, Bishop, and the clergy and people of the Diocese of Western Newfoundland in the Anglican Church, and the Dean, 
Council and Congregations of the Georgian, Huronia, and Bay Areas of the Eastern Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. In the Anglican Cycle of Prayer, we're asked to pray for Iglesia Anglicana de la Région Centrale d'Amérique. In our own diocesan cycle of prayer, we're asked to remember the National Indigenous Ministries, Archbishop Mark MacDonald, NIAA, for the National Office Staff, and the work of the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples. For the mission of the Church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those preparing for baptism and for their teachers and sponsors, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace in the world, that a spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all in danger, that they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who have asked us to pray for them, and for those whom God has placed on our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For grace to amend our lives and to further the reign of God, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Grant, O God, that the prayers we offer may be your channel for new and abundant life, not only hoped for, but worked for, through faithful word and deed. Amen. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. Thank you for your continued tithe support of your parish and the diocese. If you're interested in joining us in our support, you may do so through postage checks, electronic fund transfers, or websites such as canadahelps.org or PayPal's charities. Again, thank you. Our offertory hymn today is In the Cross of Christ I Glory.
Let us pray. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. Amen. Together we pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The Collect for this day, together let us pray. Faithful God, may we set our minds and wills to yours and take up our cross, following Christ with confidence for the glory you reveal in him, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, and in the language closest to our hearts, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today at St. Andrew's Cathedral and in your homes wherever you are. Thank you to Archbishop Melissa for her inspired word today and for her ministry here in the province, in this diocese, and indeed in the Diocese of New Westminster. May God's blessing be upon her as she enters into retirement from diocesan ministry. We also thank Elizabeth Hunt for doing the readings and the prayers and for everyone involved with our worship today. We continue to gather to worship across the diocese on uh, nightly at 9 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Mountain for service of Compline. Monday to Saturday, we gather at 7 a.m. Pacific, 8 a.m. Mountain for a service of morning prayer with Pastor Don from St. Mark's in Dawson Creek. We gather at 1215 Pacific, 115 Mountain with the Dean here at the Cathedral for a service of midday prayer. May God bless you during this week and may the God of mercy transform you by the power of his grace and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and indeed forevermore. Amen. Our concluding hymn is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, a fine Welsh hymn.
Let us go forth as people chosen and called. Thanks be to God. Thank you.